Hello once more and welcome to The Loadout, presented by The Daily Dot. That's capital T, capital D, capital E. Please remember every single bit of that information, I insist. I really do. I am your loyal host as I ever am, Jared Wynn, bringing you yet one more night of esports news, discussion, debate, diatribes, and transgressions, perhaps? I am joined by my two all-star teammates, Sam, Halo champion Lingle. Sam, how are you? Oh, I'm doing great, Jared. I can tell. Yeah, had a like, great three-day weekend. Yeah, yeah, fireworks. Yeah, yeah, Watch exciting. The Pokemon, you know. Yeah, that's a good July Fourth weekend. You know, fireworks, Pokemon, <laughs> uh, holiday. What else do you need? Nothing else here on the loadout, except for our camaraderie. Speaking of Ian Double John Barker, how are you? Uh, I'm great. I actually had to mute my mic because I have a cat who is poised to walk on camera at any moment. So apologies to the audience if we have a fuzzy gray invader. Yeah, we heard that, actually. It was a I'm nice sure accompaniment to the introduction, actually. It was a nice little so cat in heat noises. That makes <laughs> like esports what it is today. Cat in hunger. Sure. Are just starving your cat? That's the case, eh. then? Yeah, Gotta do are, something I for heard fun. you just, like, give way and torture cats or, or dogs, was it? I it, <laughs> it was cats, right? Yeah, so that makes sense to me. Ian, noted torturer and giver away of cats. <laughs> oh, we're starting early tonight. Okay, yeah. well. Actually a bit late, but we're starting early Bring with that. Bring it up. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's get right into our first subject of the night. That is Ex Peque, the wonderful mid laner from Europe, from uh, origin more specifically, retiring. Reported to retire soon after Worlds, in fact. The big event of the year. He wants to get there with his team, have one last run at glory, and then right off into the sunset successfully. Are you okay there, Ian? We're back at you, whatever you were doing. Yeah. Were you just slapping someone? To, no, I, was, I, I just saw you backhand. I, your, had to, I threw wife. a napkin at my cat. Ian, a harmless deterrent. Spousal abuse and the and torture us. here on the loadout. <laughs> <laughs> what a great start for you. Uh, let's go to Sam. Let's go ahead and just like get away from that if we can, the violence over in, in Des Moines. Uh, Sam, ex Peke, looking to retire after this 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 season. This uh, his career has spanned, I think, what, five, six years now? He's an original League of Legends champion. The original, one first of the five originals. Yes, first world champion. He's got the finally old, got his skin this year. The old ring. Yeah. He's he's finally arrived after all these years. He's he's done it. Um, your thoughts on his, as we reflect on his career, I suppose, and what he's doing now. I mean, in terms of his career, you know, it's hard to say anything other than superlatives about it, right? He won the first world championship. He's one of the best teams in Europe. He has pretty much the most iconic play in League of Legends to his name, you know, when he made the, the big backdoor play against uh, SK. And, you know, that play is like one that's going to stick with people in League for forever, for generations or however long this game is played, you know, like... Um, I mean, there's there's not very many other players who are, you know, as legendary as him. Um, but, I mean, the thing with him deciding to retire is a little surprising to me because it's not like, you know, there's a lot of other characters from his era, I suppose, who, you know, have taken a step back, right, and running teams like Reginald or Hotshot GG or, you know, Ocelot, who is, you know, his rival in that backdoor play. Um, you know, they all stepped down and they're running their own organizations. But unlike them... Ex Peke is still like on top of his game. He's still a force to be reckoned with. It's not like there's more talented players who've come along and kind of supplanted, uh, you know, supplanted some of these guys like Reginald in the mid lane where he needed to step down to remain competitive. Ex Peke is still one of the best mid laners in Europe. You could you could put him as the best mid laner in Europe if you wanted to. He's performing you know close to that level or at that level this season so far. So it's a little disappointing that someone who probably still has you know a lot more left to give in the server. Um, that he might be retiring right now. So. Yeah, he looks to be retiring. It's the report, of course, and I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's absolutely correct since it's the Daily Dot report, as a matter of fact. Uh, this is, I think, an interesting reflection of, like, what is a veteran in different games? You know, x has been around for five, six years. That makes him an old, crusty veteran in league terms. You know, he <laughs> is as old school mm -hmm. as anyone could be. There's no one who can really match that, as a matter of fact. Um, I guess someone can potentially match it, but no one can surpass his veteran status. In other games... What it means to be a veteran is much different. And Counter-Strike, for example, we have players like Forrest and Neo and Nothing who have been around for over a decade. Uh, Storm, actually, who looks to have retired after leaving Ep um, Elevate, he'd been around for even longer than that. 
So we've seen Counter Strike players stick around for a long time. But well, we've uh, seen people like Heaton, you know, take a step back similar to Xpeke, right? So. We have, we have, and we've seen StarCraft uh, careers usually go even shorter, actually. So let's talk about it's this. Just go into Hearthstone. <laughs> yeah, or just transition to Hearthstone. Um, the reason, the reason why players in different games have different shelf spans. Uh, I talked to Rich about this for a bit. I think a lot of that has to do with the the way you practice and prepare for a game. I think mm -hmm. in Counter Strike, for example, you have a much briefer. Uh, practice schedule, not because you're practicing uh, less necessarily, well, you are practicing less in terms of hours, but you're you're perhaps using them more effectively, whereas in League, it's, you know, 10, 12 hours of just League things every day, and that is a grind. It's tough to keep up with that. StarCraft, the same thing. It's just all StarCraft all the time. Fighting games, looser schedule. First-person shooters, generally looser schedule. So, uh, Ian, I'll go over to you for this. Do you think that uh, there's a problem with the way games like League and StarCraft are scheduled out that kind of burns out players prematurely? Like, how can that be addressed if so? It's hard to say whether it's the schedule specifically or just the infrastructure um, or just the development of the eSport. I, uh, the other day when we were in the chat, I mentioned to our viewers that, you know, it'll be interesting to see what the world of eSports looks like when the people who are competing in it um, have grown up with eSports. Because people like Froggen, people like Yellowstar and, and Xpeke are the sort of people who have not only had to carry the mantle of their team and develop their own skills, they've also sort of carried this whole movement on their shoulders. You know, it's it's the when the season one championship occurred, Fnatic was a world champion before any, you know, competition developed. Shortly thereafter, it exploded. And guys like Xpeke were on these huge stages, but there was still this real struggle to make esports what it is today and so I don't know that it's the practice schedule uh, exclusively that causes people to burn out so much as it's the fact that a guy like XPK now he's not just carrying the load for his team he's had to carry the load for his team for a long time and now he's a business person so I think there's a lot of pressure not only to perform but to to sort of you know handle years of fatigue and and exhaustion from being sort of a pioneer in esports. And you know, truth is, if you're cutting through the weeds with a machete, your 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 clicking arm is going to get tired eventually. Nothing tires of a clicking arm like cutting weeds with machetes. Indeed, metaphorical Indeed. weeds. Yes, exactly. A nice, well put. Tennyson would be proud of of that little <laughs> spouting off you just gave us there. Uh, Sam, what can the organizers behind League or StarCraft, like uh, the leagues, by the way, uh, I guess for Riot, the organizer behind League is the organizer behind the League for League. What can they do to perhaps lengthen the careers of players? Because it seems to me that it would be a benefit to Riot, for example, to have the same players stick around and be personalities, notable personalities for, you know, longer than uh, a few years or a few splits, most likely. I mean, I think we'll get, we will see some players you know, stick around and have one more longevity. But, um, I mean, in terms of what they can do, they can offer more salary and more incentive to keep keep playing because, I mean, that's obviously one way that you're going to get people to come continue doing it if they think it's worth it. And right now, you know, sometimes it's not going to be worth it for these guys who have to spend so much time and have spend so much effort in this grind, basically, for practice. It's not like Counter-Strike where you can boot camp for, you know, a week or two before an event, right? A couple weeks before an event. And basically, you know, load up your your effort into that period and do well. Like league, you have to be doing that all year round, basically. So, it's it's tough. Um, I mean, in terms of like the format of the league, I don't think that they should actually change anything. I think that the teams and the players themselves need to figure out ways to make sure they can handle that grind and that stress, basically. So. Yeah, I think uh, better living conditions perhaps would be of assistance. You know, we see that a lot of league players and teams. Uh, Actually, Young Buck tweeted out that picture of his uh, his living arrangement in the yeah. Copenhagen Wolves house, and it was like a, a twin mattress on the floor next to a desk. You know, that was kind of the way it was framed. And, he, of course, he framed it that way purposefully, but still, you know, that's not too far from the truth. That's his living arrangement, and it's hard to do that for years and years and just keep grinding and, and to be a part of that. Um, the Cloud9 house, the players actually have their own rooms. Imagine that. You know, they stream <laughs> they stream from their own rooms. What a you know, novelty, right? When Smee and Sneaky streams, he's a very popular streamer. He's usually in like an enclosed room separated from the rest of the house. Like, imagine what like what what great uh, flexibility that offers to have a space of your own when you are an adult. You know, when I've actually spoken with uh, Charlie Yang, EG's uh, Dota manager, and he's actually said that that 
the model of the team house. I mean, it's no secret, obviously, but he just absolutely loathes the model of the team house. If it were his, uh, you know, we we have uh, esports maybe in the chat actually talking about how you know it would be great if each player had their own house and then sort of everybody worked in a in a communal environment, sort of like uh, Major League Baseball players. But I think right now the the problem with the team house is that it's sort of the the lesser of all evils and maybe the only way to create housing I mean, for players uh you know when they don't have the credit or the capital to create to uh, arrange their own living arrangements some teams do it a little differently like team liquid they have an office where they practice at so it's basically right. like work time they go to the office every day they're there for like eight hours and they work and then they leave and you know, a lot of them they still have a house where a lot of them live but they don't necessarily have to live there but it's also like separates the work time from the free time basically where there's not necessarily that dis you know that distance from those two things when you're working and playing in the same house and maybe you're streaming and doing your leisure time on the same computer so um yeah. you know that, i mean that can help but it's also like obviously in korea and china it's working to have these kids playing you know just living their entire lives in this basically military environment so um you know, I don't know. People, they need to. Players and teams need to figure out whatever works for them personally and whatever works for their organizations. I think. Yeah, there was a European team. I think SK Gaming actually in the LCS who did the same thing as Liquid. They had like a, a base they would go and train at and then come back to their own place. I think people get too caught up sometimes in the Korean model. Um, I think it's also a cultural thing in Korea. I don't yeah. think you have to boot camp like every single week of the year in order to be successful. I think there's actually a healthier balance there, which could be better for the players. You know, it's the trick's not necessarily to practice more; it's to practice better, and making well, good use of your time. I remember reading uh, some some information from Thorin about the the Korean model and about how Western teams shouldn't be so eager to emulate that, simply because what those players are doing is not necessarily living in this supportive, you know, stable environment. They're practically competing for a bunk bed. Uh, you know, the living arrangements are terrible and it's so competitive that, uh, well, I mean, admittedly, while they have their own bed, um, which is probably a step up from some Western gaming houses, it's just, it's not the same, it, it's commitment, but it's, it's, it's also, you know, kill or be killed in the Korean environment. And that's obviously no more stable than having everybody live in the same dirty house together. Yeah, it's just also a cultural thing, as I said, and I think even we've seen the change in, in Korean and Chinese environments in some cases, like the bigger teams and better players, they don't necessarily have the old school, you know, Starcraft Brood War team house where you have the, the very cutthroat, you know, four people to a room, uh, the, B, the B team, like basically are act as slaves for the A team type of thing. <laughs> It's a very different thing, you know. We've evolved a bit in, in esports. Champions get I mean, girlfriends. On the, the flip side, though, in esports, there's not that much limiting you physically from actually training. You know, X number of hours. So That's if true. you're someone who is capable of actually focusing for 12 hours of practice every day, you're going to still benefit from that. So those people are going to have a benefit and have maybe an advantage over someone that, you know. May only be able to do it for eight hours. I think so, there's a question, though. I think know, there's a question of if it really does benefit you significantly more to train 12 hours in a day than to train perhaps seven or eight hours in a day. Like at well, some for point, for a lot of people, it might not. But I, but I, sure there are always going to be outliers who it will benefit more. So maybe that's why Faker's so good is because he can do that or something. You know, who knows? Well, it's um, it's sort of to draw a metaphor once again with sports. I mean, uh, let's say you've got five linemen. You know, perhaps one of them is going to need work on on cardio specifically. Another one is going to need strength training in their legs. Another one is going to need balance and coordination. You know, it's just there's not you don't uh, put the same training program on every member of a team when they have distinct needs. It's about figuring out what those needs are and adjusting the the environment to fit that that which of course involves a great deal of cost if you're accommodating five different players five different ways. But it's obviously, I think, the next logical conclusion for esports. Yeah, well, in athletics, you know, obviously the players can't train um, physically all day long, but they can do film yeah. study, they can do other things like that. And, also true. and we don't see them doing that, you know, 14 hours a day, 16 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Some players might make an exception and do just like, you know, eight hours of film study after eight hours of physical training. But those are exceptions. So I don't think the 12-hour-a-day the model is necessarily required to have a great team to be a top-tier team. I think just having better overall infrastructure is the real secret, and that training a normal number of hours per day is just fine. And I think in the future, it'll bear out that way. But we have to get to that point first, obviously, for it to, for it to be shown. Uh, moving on now to a big announcement that was made over the weekend, early in the weekend, actually, by one of the biggest names in League of Legends, especially in the West, Cloud9 losing out on their star jungler Meteos. A shocking announcement. 
Reverberations. We're not losing out. He's still there, right? It's just he's not in the lineup. He's not on his play. I don't know. It's, it's, it's still unclear. <laughs> it is an ambiguous situation to be sure. Although I do think that uh, Medios's tweet that he gave, his one tweet was very indicative of the situation where he made it very clear. He said, I think I'll be around as long as someone will have me. I think that's kind of a, a public way without doing any kind of interference or poaching bullshit of saying, hey, you know, I'm going to play for somebody. I'm a whether, free agent. Yes, I'm going way. to play. <laughs> whether it's Cloud9 or someone else, I'm going to play someone. I'm going to play for. I'm going to play league at a pro level. I'm not retiring. I'm not done. I'm going to play for someone because you know I have a feeling. Even if you retire, you're not done. Yeah, I mean, someone I will have right. Medios. You know, someone's probably going to have interest in this guy. I have a feeling, like the most accomplished American jungler, probably <laughs> has a home somewhere if he really wants it. You know, yeah. so let's talk about um, this whole thing first. We'll start with Cloud9, uh, the team itself. Obviously, a tremendous disappointment, Sam. Uh, I mean, I, I think, that. yeah, I predicted they missed the playoffs after a couple weeks, but even I could not have seen them playing this poorly and just looking like shit. I mean, they, they, they look awful. To, they have to win out to go 500. Yeah, if they lose there one you go. game, they have a losing record for the season. And, and that's I like ridiculous. Like They've been in the finals each of the... They will, they will lose the game. Spoiler like alert yeah. for everyone out there. I know you enjoy watching the LCS <laughs> games without spoilers, but... Spoiler alert, Cloud9 will lose at least one game. There was that inkling of hope on Saturday, you know, when they looked good in the first match with High, they had like a lead in everything, and then they blew it. They lost the Team 8. And then they lost the Team Cloud8. 9 lost the Team 8, okay? But now they're in ninth <laughs> place and Team 8's in 8th place. That's that's all, all you need to know about Cloud9 right now. So, um, Cloud9 with High in the jungle, it's his former role. He's been there before, but still, it's a change. Um, he's shot calling again now, but is that really a, you know, does it make a difference at this point for him to be shot calling? Incarnation is still... I mean, he went to a comfort pick this weekend with Zed. Didn't make a big difference, you know, after playing Azir, God, like 50 times and just failing every time with him. Um, I you know, think Jat said that he didn't use an ultimate as Zed the entire He did not. He did not press game. R. He did not press R. Uh, we actually joked about uh, um, uh, Steven brought up the fact that maybe he was doing the secret, like, uh, you, you max Q and E first for, like, for the, the better poke, like, so you never have R. But I think he actually did skill R. He just never used it. So, yeah, not a great showing by Incarnation, which is kind of the expectation for him now. So all these things established, you know, high in the jungle, shot calling again, but to what to what point? Uh, elimination still just being kind of the, the stodgy support that doesn't really affect Filling the game. Filling a spot on the roster. He's there, technically. Uh, incarnation has been a disappointment from, from the word go. What is Cloud9's outlook here, Sam? I mean, it was kind of interesting because they did look more proactive and stronger in the early game with high. Um, they were... He was actually making things happen on the map, which wasn't happening with Meteos for whatever reason. They also kind of changed up their picks, obviously. Like you mentioned, they brought out Zed and, uh, what is it? Was it Twisted Fate, I think, for, for Incarnation, which is a bit quite a bit different from what they've been picking for him traditionally, which is, like you said, you know, all those Azir and Kog'Maw, which are these, like, passive passive champions that um, he's not really, I guess, known to play, like, in solo queue, so... It seemed like they were trying to make some changes to be a little more, little more aggressive than what they were doing, and then they ended up losing in like the mid and late game, which is kind of odd for the old, old Cloud Nine that we know. So, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, High didn't look, you know, that bad. He didn't look amazing, but uh, it seemed like they. I mean, they still have problems. You know, I mean, it's it's hard to bring in someone new, and you kind of always have like a little bit of a Cinderella period, or I guess, or uh, I forget what you call it. <laughs> When you have someone new on the team, you know, it's uh, but, and a you grace play period. a little better. Grace yeah. period, yes. It, and, yeah, it's, and everyone plays a little better. You're excited. You're hyped up for this change, you know, and, and it's still not working out. I mean, obviously, they lost two games, and losing a teammate is very disappointing at this point, considering they're, you know, one of the favorites to maybe be auto-relegated. So, right. um, I don't know. It's, yeah, the, it's the question now with Emperor and Ninja joining TDK is, is Cloud9 a threat for auto-relegation? I mean, it's... Well, that's one thing, interesting thing, though, too, because everyone's like, oh, my God, they look so great, right? They came in and beat Dignitas in the first game, but they haven't won since then. Yeah, they went 0-2 this weekend. Yeah. But, I mean, can you really put it beyond Cloud9? Can anything be put beyond Cloud9 at this point? I don't think so. <laughs> I, I'm not even joking. I think you have to consider every possible, like, worst-case scenario with Cloud9 because they've played that poorly at this point. So it would not surprise me if they got auto-relegated. I don't think they will. I think they'll uh, play a relegation series. They'd probably play against them. Oh, who is it? Who is uh, who is 4-0 with Renegades? I can't remember actually right now, but um, I don't think they'll get relegated in the relegation series. I do think they'll be here next split. I just don't know what form. I, I would be shocked if Elimination returned for the team. I would be uh, surprised if High returned again. So that was the rumor today, right? Was that 
Medios is actually dual queuing with Sneaky as support as a potential replacement for Lemon. <laughs> So they're they're literally CLGing their roster because yeah. that that would be a new level of meltdown uh, for this iteration of Cloud Nine. It's, it's, it didn't make sense because I mean if you're going to have a support high makes more sense because you play the support mid anyway, and Medios makes more sense just playing jungle where he's you know been the most yeah. perhaps the most successful jungler in the West for the past two years. So I don't know, Team Coast would be the matchup uh, for for oh, Cloud Nine yes. if um, Renegades qualified automatically and then Cloud Nine finished ninth. It would be Team Coast, so that would be a fun series. Coast versus Cloud Nine for a spot in the Spring uh, LCS next year. How <laughs> how dramatic and just prestigious that would that would be, you know? I would just be very impressed with the the, the idea of it. Actually, has impressed me. It'd be a hell of a matchup, right? Real marquee relegation showdown. I, it would probably do the best numbers ever for a relegation <laughs> match. Actually, Team Coast versus Cloud Nine to be real. I'm not even joking. Like it would. It would be great numbers. Oh, for it most certainly would. would yeah. The highest if they get in a match, no matter who they're against. Yeah. I mean. yeah. They they could not play Cloud Nine Tempest. There's actually a rule against that. So you couldn't have the the Cloud Nine inter Cloud Nine match with a with a potential throw. Possibilities. Hey, at least they have twice the chance to keep a team in LCS, right? Exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I you don't think that was what they were relying on coming into the split. <laughs> but hey, you know, you take what you can get, I suppose. For Cloud9, you have to take what you can get at this point because <laughs> they, look, they look fucking terrible. Awful. What a bad league team this is. I mean, the Awful. way this all happened like makes it seem like there's, you know, who knows what kind of issues are going on. Like, well, I would be I would be very surprised if he came back as a support because the grapevine speaks pretty clearly, saying that there was a bit of a um, breakdown in communication, let's say, among the team, and that resulted to the snap decision to move with a new, different lineup. Uh, so I'd be I'd be surprised, to say the least, if Medio suddenly came back in a support role. Of course, of all things, like switching from jungle to doing a duo lane with. With Sneaky. I mean, another friend. Well, he is sort of best friends with Sneaky, right? And I get that. I mean, and they, the, the other click yeah, or something. I don't I know. I joked yesterday that, I mean, I thought, I thought I wondered if one of them was going to change their hair style now that they were apart. <laughs> you know, it seems like they should have to change now that they're no longer twins in the team. We'll see. Um, just a little bit of theory crafting here, Sam. If Medios does depart Cloud9, what do you see as a good fit for him? The, the natural fit everyone's talked about is CLG because they need something to happen. They have potential playmakers in the top lane, mid lane, bottom lane. The only spot they don't have one, it would seem, is the jungle, and Midos would fit that bill pretty cleanly. CLG going through their usual mid-season throw period right now. Um, is Midos to CLG a good fit? And if not, or even if so, where else might he end up if he does go somewhere else? I think it would be a, actually a really good fit there because, um, I mean, Smithy was always known for, for ganking early and being aggressive, and that's kind of not what they need him to do on CLG or what he does do now, whereas Medios can play um, a little more defensively and be where he's needed um, while he has, like, strong laners on this team who are going to be able to hold up and let him, you know, become a force later in the game, which is, like, the style he wants to play, but it doesn't work on Cloud9 right now because they're, you know, struggling uh, everywhere on the map, basically. So I think that would actually be a really good fit for, for Medios in terms of play style-wise on CLG. I think I think that could make that work very well as long as they, you know, have their shot calling in hand, which, you know, is who knows with that. But, um I mean, I think you know everyone. Everyone's pointing that out. It's a pretty obvious one, but that that, that would probably be a, the best fit that I would see right now. Um, I mean, I think there are a couple other teams that maybe could use a jungler, or you know, could replace a jungler. But it's harder to to see how they uh, how that would work out right now. I think. Yeah, the communications I think would also be a good fit with uh, with CLG because you know it's been talked about that perhaps the the bottom line does not call for ganks quite the way they should. You know, does not communicate very well. Medios tends to do his own thing anyway. He's going to call where he wants to go, you know, and that I think makes sense when you have a team that the lanes don't quite call out for games the way they should. If it's still a problem, we don't really know. You know, that was a problem apparently before the split. Maybe with Link gone, everything's changed just magically. Like, whoosh. All better now. Most teams, I think, will be interested in, in the potential for Medios. What do you think about, um, about TSM as an option, Sam? Well, that's one I haven't really heard people mention, but it's kind of interesting. I mean, um, you know, it would be great to see, like, you know, one of the best European players play with one of the best American players with Medios and Bjergsen together. And if Medios is more proactive about um, where he needs to go, you know, that seems to kind of be a, a struggle with Santorin is that he's not as proactive in terms of, like, what he wants to do. And his laners aren't taking any initiative, like Wild Turtle or, you know, Dyrus, in terms of calling out for ganks. So that might be 
uh, more effective for them. But I mean, kind of Santorin already kind of plays that, you know, the farming style that Meteos does and gets criticized for it in a lot of games. So, you know, who knows if that would necessarily be an improvement with, with Meteos, but that would definitely be an interesting, uh, an interesting change for them to make. Santorin does seem to take it to an extreme sometimes like just not be even being on the map basically like hey guys i'm just gonna go farm you know don't worry about it if you get well, medios is criticized for that too though and some you know like in some international games and things like that where it's like well it's not like he played a bad game but he just you know didn't really have an impact much so you know who knows yeah not much of an impact especially against impact yeah i'm there for that uh ian we whoa there Ian. He's gone. I'm not sure what's going on. It, my camera froze, but I'm back now. Oh, Esports yeah. soldiers on. Sam had an interesting look for a second there. Kind of a folded <laughs> in within his own face type of thing going on. Uh, Ian, pro timing as I throw it to you to talk about uh, Virtus Pro reverse sweeping Team Empire in the Esport Old Final. Um, a pretty interesting result there. Obviously disappointing for Team Empire. Getting reverse swept in any MOBA game is going to be a pretty long, drawn-out, depressing experience. Pretty disappointing for uh, anybody. Why don't you tell me how... Oh, there you are. Welcome back again. Why don't you explain to us how that happened? How did Empire manage to let loose this grip they had on the final? The... Looking over the games, uh, things started out very well for Empire. And uh, that's because, for whatever reason, Empire understood the newest iteration of Dota, and uh, Virtus Pro simply did not. Um, I think another thing that contributes into that, I'll, I'll elaborate on that in, in a second, but it, it's important to understand that going into this match, Virtus Pro had been swept three games to zero by Evil Geniuses in uh, the Dota Pit Winners Final in what was arguably the fastest best of five of the year. It was an absolute you know, runaway victory for Evil Genius. Is that really an arguable thing? I think it'd be timed out, so it wouldn't really be arguable as much as it would be measurable, I think, <laughs> Ian. Wait, wait what? So I missed the continue, joke. Continue, continue. Okay, I, th I think I will. It's not a joke. Um, and, and then uh, shortly thereafter, like literally just a couple days later, Cloud9 did the exact same thing to them, although they, they dropped a game initially. Cloud9 sort of manhandled them. It wasn't quite as decisive a victory. But Virtus Pro seemed to have this, this growing pain over the past couple of days where they didn't understand going into the international that the newest iteration of Dota uh, belongs to the aggressor. And Virtus Pro were very much drafting around the the carry potential of Illidan and uh, and G in the mid lane. They were saying, let's draft defensive supports and let's give them the support that they need and the safety they need to sort of farm to victory. And that that format simply does not work anymore. And so uh, when you looked at the draft, they were giving up power picks like Tusk and Naga Siren, who are these great offensive lockdown supports that get the snowball rolling. No pun intended. Uh, to Empire, and then shortly, huh. about, yeah, see, snowball. I Tusk. got it. Anyway, um, game three, they finally decided to sort of flip the script. They they took the aggressive supports. They started favoring the bounty hunter specifically, uh, which is a hero right now that is arguably first ban worthy, simply because track gold and the bonus gold that it gives to your team, uh, combined with his ability to really lock down ganks because he can basically be perma stealthed and crit immediately out of stealth helps lock down ganks and get you going they started prioritizing those aggressive picks and and lo and behold empire just folded uh now that being said that's not, it's not like games three and four weren't close Vem or virtus pro won by the skin of their teeth and then empire made the absurd decision to draft a uh carry wraith king in the safe lane um which you know melee supports are not doing well in safe lanes right now that's why you see gyrocopter um you know for example huskar doing really well with eg and so it feels like virtus pro sort of figured out their opponents which is which is great because that's that's sort of indicative of where the meta is right now that you play an opponent in a best of five uh figure out a dynamic dra draft and then play against their tendencies in a way that gives you the early edge and they snowballed to uh to a reverse sweep now, both teams are going to TI5. Uh, both teams have had some very notable results uh, over the course of the year and look quite good at times. Um, which of them do you think, Ian, is a bigger threat going into the international, Team Empire or Virtus Pro? I would have to say, you're really putting me on the spot here, um, I'm going to have to say Virtus Pro. 
I feel like Empire's script continues to be the same that it's always been. It's sort of different, you know, second verse, same as the first. And Empire also has a tendency for Lord only knows what reason to sort of wilt before the international main event. Virtus Pro, on the other hand, is continues to adapt and learn. FNG um, is sort of the surprise mad scientist of the uh, Dota 2 draft and continues to give them solutions, even as, you know, as we saw when they're two games zero down. So I think Virtus Pro is a greater threat. However, I will We'll put the caveat on that that neither is a viable threat to the uh, the terrible trinity of Team Secret, Evil Geniuses, and Invictus Gaming. They're just they're playing on an echelon below at the moment. I see. We'll find out, I guess. Newbie were not considered the top tier going into last year's international, I don't believe. No, hmm? I mean they 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 were and then they underperformed. The, in in the group stage, and then they sort of got their their things together. But they they were slumping a little bit, but not in the way that Empire slumps, where they seem to just lose their identity before the main event happens. Right. So. Right. Well, that's good, Ian. Thank you. <laughs> I, I appreciate your opinion with a with a caveat, of course. Can just give us the hard stuff. How to give us a caveat? I understand. No. I'm a complicated individual, Jared. Very complicated. You have, you have cat abuse and, and slapping your spouse on on stream. It's just it's awful. Actually, I'm disappointed in you. Moving on though. Uh, but sticking around in Dota, to uh, Vilot, an Eastern European caster, went on record saying that he thinks online tournaments are shit, basically. They suck. They're just bad. Get them out of here. They are. They're just the worst. No spectators, no excitement, no reason to watch, no waste of time. That was, you know, in a, I'm very accurately, I think, summing up his, his big blog post on this subject. So let's talk about that. Um, and Ian, I'll stick with you for it to give us your brief summary of, of what he, he talked about and, and your... Uh, your reaction to that, being, of course, someone very vested in the, the lifeblood of the Dota 2 scene. In love with this dead game, as we've uh, dubbed it. You know, honestly, the, the VLOD has made a lot of comments over the past several months. And uh, some are a little outlandish, some are right on the money. Uh, in this case, you know, this is this this reads not necessarily like another VLOT doomsday prediction. It, it simply reads like another um, call from the Dota community, one among many, frankly, uh, to sort of consolidate the leagues into a into a focused format. I mean, yeah, the the Esportal League happened and it had an incredible final, but who watched it? I mean, in that way, I, I agree with Vila. The The simple fact is that we're pouring a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of man hours into tournaments that simply don't have the sort of impact on the overall competitive narrative that it, live tournaments do. And so I feel more like his, his blog post is not saying all all online tournaments are garbage. It's simply saying our time is better spent putting people in the seats and consolidating our leagues in a meaningful way as opposed to continuing to have these these fractured, disconnected tournaments that confuse even diehard fans. So we have these discussions pretty regularly. And when we talk about Dota 2, one of the main things we talk about is the prevalence of tournaments and how there's so many, the qualifiers go on forever, and there's just a never-ending wave of events, basically. Uh, Sam... We have the talk so many times, so often, and have had it for so long now. Do you see in any near future any change to that, or is it just something we're going to bitch about until the end of time with no resolution? I mean, isn't there supposed to be, like, the Valve Majors coming in sometime or something? Yeah, in November, where I believe they start. Where that clarity where there's things that we can care about that are live events, and then we can just not care about the rest, like, real lot. I mean... <laughs> is that ideal? I, I mean, I think that's, you know kind of the way that you have to go i mean it is nice that there's all these events for people to play in and things like that but it's like way too much and like i don't care about any of these online events playing in online events is, is crappy and it's like not a good experience to watch them either like it's not really a fair environment for these teams to compete in even though there's you know thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on the line it's i mean these events should at least have like land finals or something like that you know like have a final for the top four top eight teams Right. Send them somewhere. You don't even have to have spectators like VLOT wants. You know, that would improve the experience drastically for everyone involved. But, um, you know, they're not doing it. And, I mean, I, you know, Ian said, it's, you know, they're wasting all these man hours, but it's like they're not putting in enough man hours or they're, you know, they're being lazy, basically. Like, it takes a little effort to have a live event, but it's not that difficult. Like, people have been doing it for years in other games. And My favorite part of any given Dota 2 online tournament is when they have to pause because someone disconnected. I love that part of watching Dota 2 online. It's just the best. Uh, well, that's yeah. another thing that's that part that, of the LCS. I mean, that, that's another thing that genuinely needs to be discussed is the fact that you know Source Two 
uh, which is still in beta. The Dota 2 Reborn beta represents the first significant investment uh, in improving both the infrastructure itself, the, the server infrastructure, and how the software handles the network infrastructure. So, you know, if, if anything, you could complain that online tournaments suck because uh, they're completely ruining the competitive integrity of these competitions because people have to fucking pause because somebody got uh, either DDoSed or another server crashed or they're playing on Luxembourg and they have 500 ping. It's just, you know, it, it's it's like when we talked about the, the ESL LAN this past weekend, the fact that players are looking across the aisle and watching the flash on their faces, you know there's a baseline expectation that players will be in boots. At this point, there's a baseline expectation that when players meet and there's literally hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line, the conditions will be favorable to a continuous and contiguous competition, and that simply doesn't exist. It's unfortunate. And I will say that, uh, just subjectively speaking, it seems to happen more often in Dota 2 than any other game. It's like an oh, expectation. Yeah. Like you, just, you, you just know it's going to be a disconnect. The little red <laughs> bars are going to come up at some point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing I think with Dota is that like, they have like a longer history of playing online tournaments when they were kind of like a this mod, where they sure. had more international online events than any other you know game in history. I think pretty much in mm -hmm. esports, so it's kind of like something that the community and the players are more used to than some of these other games. So I think that there's maybe less of a backlash against this, and people are able to accept it more maybe. Um, so I, you know, maybe there's a bit of a culture thing going on where this isn't changing as quickly as it should be. Well, how do you run a better online event then? Because I've seen like some online leagues do do a decent job. Um, Face it is one I like. Face it runs really good Counter Strike online broadcast. They have like a set time here. It's like four games or three games today. We have a consistent studio presence of entertaining personalities who throw us from one game to the next. You know, it, it moves along at a good pace, a good clip, and it's it's fun to watch if you like the game. Uh, that seems like a reasonable thing to ask for, uh, having a studio presence and just having a kind of base of operations and having someone making sure that the game is moved smoothly, is that too much for most of these leagues to provide? Is that too much to ask for? I mean, I'll, I just ask that honestly, Ian. You know, and it's, it, I, I'll, I'll counter your argument by saying it's, your, your question by just saying it's not that simple. Uh, in the world of Dota 2 specifically, I, I don't think you ask yourself, how can we run a better online tournament? I think you ask yourself, why do we keep running a fucking online tournament? Uh, because the fact is that, that Dota Pit, which had, you know, a great final, albeit uh, a CIS team versus a North American team doesn't do well for server, you know, conditions or anything like that. Uh, the, the games have looked good, the prize pool is good, and the, the games have run pretty much on schedule with minimal disconnects, uh, you know, when <laughs> God wills it. Uh, the the problem is that a team like Team Secret, for example, which is a big money team, which is what you need to make your online tournament worth anything nowadays. You need the big names because nobody recognizes what's going on in your tournament unless they see big names yeah, in just it. Just like we need Ian Barker, they need Team Secret. It breaks precisely. What would this show be without me? Um, you know, Team Secret, for example, delayed uh, Dota Pit by, I, I believe it was at least a month. Because they said, you know, we're too busy. We're in so many online tournaments trying to sort of nickel and dime both our practice hours and our prize yeah. money. And, and then, then, then at the last minute, then what they, happened, Ian? they canceled. Ah. <laughs> They're gone. Poof. The big name is gone and the, the competition has been delayed for a month. And everybody's had to retool their schedules around Team Secret. And so the problem isn't, isn't once again, we've talked about this to death. The problem isn't, isn't what are tournaments doing wrong. It's what, what is Dota 2 as a competitive environment doing wrong. So one of my questions would be, like, is it too easy? Like, I don't know enough about this. I'm not as familiar with, you know, how the tournaments work and the Dota scene. But is it too easy for some of these organizers to basically monetize tournaments because they can, you know, sell in-game items and make a better revenue stream than other events? So there's more incentive for them just to kind of ch churn out these events? 100%. So is yeah. that like the major problem that we have that's kind of causing this to happen? I mean... It, well, certainly. I mean, when... when... I mean, it's it's bad to to draw on the summit as an example because they they did run a solid tournament. They brought people there and and they, and they always they do. They actually everything. looked at it as one of the, the, <laughs> the good people. And in fact, they were one who was looked at as a potential receiver of a Dota major before Valve took them all in house. Yeah, well, and and you know, and so they deserve credit. But uh, I, I hate to throw it back on Vlot, but the fact that we've had you know you can have five star ladders a year. And they're all supposed to be significant. And each one throws out, uh, you know, a tiny st set, a lifestealer set. You know, they throw out just all of these sets willy-nilly and people buy them. And, and you're right You're right in asking that, Sam. The fact is that, that VLOT makes a lot of money doing that, even without a land final. 
uh, you know, he's making bank on selling both uh, tickets and in-game items. And so to a degree, yeah, I think it is almost too easy uh, for people to hold a profitable tournament. And at a certain point, you know, it became necessary for Valve to step in and sort of corral everybody and say, okay, look, we've got this fucking Wild West out here. Everybody's robbing the bank. Um, let's let's focus our efforts a little bit and make it a little easier on the players and the, and the spectators to figure out what the hell's going on. I know, Ian, you say it's not as simple as just having a studio presence and then having games run with that in the background, but it's that much more complicated to have a live event. So I think if, if the live event is too much for you, too expensive, I think the studio presence is perhaps a good middle ground. It's the minimum, I think, you need to have if you want to run a really decent online spectator event, spectator-friendly event, is to have a consistent studio presence, like we have here, and be able to broadcast games from there as kind of a hub, you know, as a base operation. So mm -hmm. there's some central element to your show, because it is an entertainment show, right? It's a show that people are watching. So you add some central element to it just to give it consistency and make it feel a bit more together and just a little more relatable to people watching, not just disembodied voices talking into <laughs> Skype. Well, you know? but the, the counter argument to that, though, is that you, you've got, people have tried that. They've tried that, for example, Dream League. Uh, DreamHack held their their Dream League, and the problem they ran into is people still uh, flaked on them. And so what you end up ha what you end up with is instead of running, you know, literally two hours of some Monster Cat, you know, mix, you know, with your item set on the on in the background rotating with your sponsorship message, you literally end up with people who have put their time and their hours into coming into the studio who are getting paid to sit and talk about the latest, you know, uh, Tidehunter set. And and I mean the the simple fact is that there's a there's a much bigger systemic problem here than just how people are running tournaments. It's just everything's so scattered that that nobody from the the as you so eloquently put it the the disembodied voices to the studio presence can sort of run their thing without expecting any interruption from a busy schedule and shitty servers. Shout outs to Monster Cat. Shout outs to Monster Cat. Respect. Did you know, folks, that we have a top five highlights thing here at the Daily Dot. It's like a top 10, but, you know, half is good, which is still pretty great, actually. We do have a top five. So please, allow yourself a few minutes to kind of just embrace this and take it in. Wash it over you, and we'll come back when I'm going to talk about it. So, come on, watch. Another big weekend means another batch of big plays. Welcome to another Loadout Top 5. Malganis! At number five, Malganis plus Brawl saves the game for show. Back in life, Tet Range is going to push toward damage, but he doesn't take out the Accolade of Pain. So this is the turn you have to Brawl, and you hope that this pans out. 25% chance for this Malganis to live. That would be the disaster turn for Crash. Malganis lives! Malganis wins the Brawl, and does two from slipping out of their hands here. At number four, Flusha turns a lost round on its head. The first kill keeps spraying, but now all of is very low on health, and they have got no more grenades. There is no kit, though, on Cloud They've got almost no time if they die it. now. He jumps, he gets the shot, and that's probably going to be the round. Shroud can't do a thing here. Flush him. He's probably dead. Yeah. At number three, Double Lift flashes the gank for first blood. <laughs> double Lift gets first blood. He's going to chase him down. At number two, Ninja makes his presence felt in the North American LCS. Oh, wow. Ninja forces the flash from Inox, but he. Oh, what is he doing? What a play from Ninja. Control of this round. And number one, Shroud Scout puts his mark on 2015. Shroud gets a kill. Grim's gonna go down. Shroud showing up. It's now down to Oliver. Oh, oh, oh my god, he takes him down. For the best in esports news and analysis, tune in every Monday through Thursday to the load. The voice needs work, but other than that, wow. I'm impressed. <laughs> the top five plays of the week. I have to say, uh, watching the Fnatic Cloud9 plays, a little bit depressing. Uh, Cloud9 came so far, you know, had a 15-11 lead on Dust2, had a 13-8 lead the map prior, and just it, it didn't quite work out for them. It didn't quite pan out. They had the skill, the ability, they had the scout plays, but that flush around preceding that was a Freakazoid, I believe, three kill that should have guaranteed the round and the map for Cloud9, and they just they could not rise to the... In fact, not only could they not rise to the occasion, they actually shrunk away from the occasion, like shrinkers do, you know. And that's not a good, that's not a good look for Cloud9. So, disappointing. I'm disappointed in you, Cloud9. Personally, I am. And you should feel worse about that than losing the tournament. You should. <laughs> my, my personal disappointment. How about the two of you? Big place in the top five? Ian? Yeah. What stood out to, what stood out to you? Um, honestly, 
uh, I I put it as number one with Shroud's, you know, scout and everything like that. But I think that <laughs> Flush's clutch was probably the most impressive to me, simply because I felt it right here. Like it wasn't it wasn't just like we can't I mean, tell what you're pointing impressive. to, so it's it kind of an ambiguous thing you just did. We can't was, see what you're pointing to, Ian. Where'd oh, you feel my, it? My heart. Oh, okay. <laughs> right in here. Right. This sure. Guy. I no, totally it's believe just that. Like, I, I knew it was the most impressive because it was equally the most soul-crushing play uh, in the top five. So. And it wasn't even EG losing, and you still got your soul crushed. <laughs> and I still got my soul crushed. Correct. That. Sam, it was. American homers. I'm sure, <laughs> Sam, for you, it, 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 was a... it was like, this was, this was the perfect moment for <sighs> American CS to, you know, finally, yeah. finally make it. Yeah. I, was, I was pleased though, just to have the, the yeah. mixed results. It took me back to like the old days when you expected mixed results from the whole, like every region had a team in the, in the play as opposed to, you know, the occasional team from outside Europe maybe has a play at some point, maybe in the year. I mean, you can't be unhappy with the results, you know, as an, Amer as an American Counter-Strike fan, yeah, right? Or, I mean, or just a fan who wants to have more of a global game, period. I think it was a nice weekend to see that kind of that kind of thing happen. Uh, hopefully we see more of a global reach. I want to see Renegades continue to do well. I want to see some Asian teams do anything ever. That would be awesome <laughs> for me personally. we got to get CS back in the Asian market. It's tough. Make it free to play, basically. You know, I want to see the WNVs and the Hacker Gaming and the and the Maven crew. I want to see them back in line. Does anyone know who Maven crew is? Like, is that like a shout out to someone no one will catch? Like, probably is. Forgive me for that one. So yeah, nice job, Ian. I enjoyed the top five plays. Check it up on YouTube, by the way. Daily.esports on YouTube for all those and more. Uh, before we go, we have a couple more topics to hit real quickly. Um, speaking of league player movements, Sam. With Medios taking his leave of Cloud9, maybe, possibly, who knows what's going on there. Uh, we also think Adrian's going to be leaving Tim Impulse. Now, possibly. for me, kind of a strange thing if it does happen again, possibly. Because Adrian has said that he wants to play more of an aggressive role. And Tim Impulse is good at being aggressive. Like, above all other things, they, they're, they're, they're very aggressive. You know, Perhaps more so than they're actually good this split, they're very aggressive. Rush is the aggressive overdrive jungler. I've always been confused why they wouldn't let Adrian play his natural aggression style as support. And now if they're going to cut ties with him, it's even more confusing to me because you don't let your player you brought in for your support role actually play his preferred style of support. So what is your feel on Adrian and Team Impulse and how this situation plays out? If it does play out this way... I mean, Adrian's played, um, you know, like last season, he was playing Leona and all those engaged champions all the time. This this season, the meta is a little different for support, and I feel like Impulse is trying to, like, figure out more styles or something because they've kind of, like, struggled to do anything other than that hyper-aggression, and they've really struggled in basically the Cinderhulk meta um, that kind of started in, at the playoffs when they ended up losing those, those odd games where they had Rush on Nunu. Um, and since then, they haven't been as strong. Part of that's just because of the way the meta's gone, I think. I think that they've really struggled with that, like a tank jungler meta that you can't have Rush making plays early in the game that, you know, bring them bring them ahead and bring them wins as easily. So um, I think that they've been trying to, like, work out more styles, and maybe it doesn't really work with Adrian, so they're trying to see if they can change something there. I don't know. Um, but I don't know. It seems like it could be an odd change, but it could be good. I mean, even on his aggressive heroes, you know, like last season, he was he had some great games like on champions like Leona, but he also had some bad ones where he's like missing a lot of solar flares and skill shots. So maybe they're just not happy with his performance overall. Um, it's not necessarily just his style. It could be. I've seen some good games from this split, like on Alistair, for example. Um, mm -hmm. I don't see him as a problem, certainly. I think uh, perhaps a big problem for, for Tip is that Zhao Wei Zhao has not been an MVP candidate at all. Uh, that's a big change. I think that is a big problem. People don't really want to talk about that because he's like this really popular player. He has this cool personality and he's really cuddly and lovable and whatnot. And, you know, he was the MVP last season, but, uh, or not last season, last year. Um, and he, um, but he just hasn't really fit in with the team. I think that, I mean, the language barrier is definitely a problem. You're adding like a third language into the mix when you already have English and Korean. And he just hasn't played very well. Like he likes to, troll a lot there's a lot of reports where he trolls in practice where he you know plays random champions and picks yasso he was picking yasso in lcs games last season when you know, yasso was even worse than that in that meta and um it just seems like they're they're struggling in large part because of that and it's hard for the rest of the players to work around uh, him when he's playing that way so um that's something that you know they they probably need to fix but uh, who knows how they do that? I mean, it's hard to find a player who is as talented as him if they can somehow get him to be more motivated in terms of or more professional in his approach to the game, I guess. 
Um, but, you know, I don't know. It's it's interesting. I mean, I thought it was interesting how you said that uh, Impulse was struggling for a playoff spot when, you know, they're 7-5 and five with CLG and beat them this week. <laughs> I think that their performance has actually gone on a, gone up recently in part because the Cinder Hulk meta is kind of going away and Rush is able to play other junglers like Needley came, you know, in popularity the past week or two. He had like a eight kills in a game where they had 15 kills total on Needley, I think, on Saturday. So. Right. Uh, I think things are looking up for Impulse basically only just because the meta might be changing in their favor. So uh, we might see a late, a late season surge from them again like that we did last split. We could. It's hard to trust this team, though, because of the style of play they have and because they're so them. inconsistent. You know, uh, impact, very inconsistent. Rush is the definition of inconsistent. I mean, this guy can put up the worst KDAs and then you just go off the next game. Um, and that's his style of play. You know, he just can't help himself. He's a ham every game. And then, of course, Zhao Wei Zhao, you know, not at his level he's seen, and the bottom lane is not really anything to remark over. So we'll see. Uh, tip does not thrill me. I, I still watch. I still like watching them play. Uh, they're fun to watch because they're so crazy at times. But uh, in terms of a playoff contender, and Russian impact playing together is always always like a delight to watch, even know. if double lift is you know schooling them like in the top five plays or whatever. But. Yeah, that is kind of fun <laughs> to watch. Like these two hyper aggressive players who are known for their their style just get like bamboozled, if you will, by double lift. Language. Who then right. lost the Language. Game. In the top lane, of all things, you know, top lane double lift, best double lift, I think. Uh, lastly, Ian, Double John. We saw Leffen triumph at the uh, FC Return event. A nice win for him over some very tough competition. Indeed. Beating Hungrybox in the final, Armada placing third, other notable names in Smash behind them. So impressed with Leffen again. Um, I've seen the the calls of Leffen as the next big star in Smash before, though. Not the first time he's been in line to ascend to the throne, and then we get to the Evo, and then Mango wins or Armada takes him out. He just he, he fails, you know, basically he fail fishes. So you know, is this the time when Leffen breaks through all the way? And if it is, what makes this different than the other times he was going to break through all the way? The the key to understanding what Leffen is doing right now lies not in what Leffen is doing, but in what's happening around him. The this sort sounds of so ecosystem. deep already, Ian. I have to say, no, it's 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 true. Well, because what people don't understand about about Smash is that there there are a lot of esports with significant history that is well acknowledged. Smash has a significant history that kind of goes like bizarrely unnoticed. I mean, these are players, we talk about the five gods, you know, these are not players who have taken their stature lightly. They practice as hard as they possibly can. They re they focus and they refocus their game. And so what's going on with Leffen is not necessarily, um, you know, the, 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 that Leffen is getting better, just that Leffen is getting better. Leffen is definitely getting better. He's, he's sort of reined in his emotional play style and he's learned to focus uh, both his neutral game and his punishes and that's, that's made a huge difference. He's just committed himself to his craft, craft like so many before him. The difference is that you talk about Hungrybox, for example. Hungrybox um, has a great job lined up as a chemical engineer, which means he's going to be making buco bucks very soon. Um, so he's already putting it on the back burner. Um, Mewtwo and he King, embarrassed Reggie. And, and, embar and he still embarrassed Reggie. But yeah. that was a really bad show match. Yeah. Um, but th then you talk about guys like Mewtwo King. Uh, Mewtwo King is a guy who's been around for so long that at this point you think he's, st you know, he's sort of starting to fade. He's a fading hey, star. Ian, you bring up Mewtwo King. Do you want to hear my favorite Mewtwo King story? Wait, let's hear it. Uh, probably not, actually. Let's move on. <laughs> you can tell me later. Um... The uh, and then you talk about Mango. When I when I was at Big House Four, I actually got to talk to Mango, and he literally said, um, "You know, I'm probably not going to be doing this for much longer." And I said, "Why?" And he just threw his hands up in the air as if it was so obvious, which it was, and said, "I've won two Evos." You know, the fact is that that we're at a we're at a point in the evolution of Smash where there's a new guard coming in, and while Leffen has certainly gotten better, give him his credit, um, the old guard is sort of fading out. And so what we're seeing is not necessarily the rise of Leffen, but the, a transition into sort of a new phase of of Super Smash Brothers melee. That's honestly extremely exciting to watch. I'll be so sad if Mingo walks away. Who else is going to wear the American flag headband during the Evo final? <laughs> Who else? Who else, Ian? Tell me. Uh, Axel wear the uh, Arizona flag cape. He's well, known for that. Will Armada wear the American flag headband during the final? Uh, sadly not, because he's Swedish. Will Zero do it? Yeah, I mean, will Amsa do it? He's Argentinian. <laughs> will Amsa do it? Japanese. Yeah. Who then? No one. I, I exactly. think I see the common thread in the jokes here. I think My I point get it. proven 
No one will do it. <laughs> the flag will be dropped under the ground, desecrated illegally by Mango if he drops. Don't do it, Mango. For me. Please. Don't do it. That's it for Loadout today. I hope you enjoyed the show. I certainly did. I know Sam did. I did too. I know Ian was bitter about it, though. That's okay. But that's okay. We can Usually handle it. Yeah. Ian's a very bitter individual. Has a hard time with just life every day. That's fine. That's what I hear. Yeah. Back tomorrow with fighting games. More of them. Not just Smash. A lot of fighting games, actually. With Efren Salinas anchoring the show. And on Thursday, come back with Richard Lewis and the League of Legends in-studio crew. So join us for that. Please, I beg you. I insist, in fact. If you like the show, follow the channel. It's down... It's down... Down there. Down there. <laughs> follow the channel. Press the little heart thing. YouTube, Esports for more top fives and recordings of every show we do here in the studio. And, of course, Twitter and Facebook at dot .esports. Follow us. Love us. Come to us. Come with us into the new age of esporting. That's it. Bye.